Thank you, everybody, for joining us back here at A Tire Pharma's channel. We have a special guest for you guys here today as we sit here with the Vice President of Corporate Development at A Tire, Mr. Peter Villiger. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Michael. Perfect. I wanted to dive into some intricacies around your role, but before we do that, let me know about your past experience and how you wound up in this role in the first place. Sure. So uh, I'm you know, Vice President of Corporate Development at ATIA, so my responsibilities there really encompass two main areas of, of focus. So I head up all of our business development partnering efforts, and then I also, through that, support kind of the commercial um, analysis we do on our programs. Mm -hmm. The second main piece of work that I do there is running our project management group. So heavily involved with our development programs through that. And, you know, again, you know, helping them plan for, for market access and, and competitive intelligence uh, work that they do there. Um, the way that I got into that really is, you know, through kind of spending time in both of those roles at, at a couple of different companies over the years. So I've worked on development projects from, you know, uh, preclinical stage all the way through to, uh, you know, launching drugs, um, and then also worked on business development, both on the buy and sell side uh, mm -hmm. during my career for, um, you know, multiple, different stages and sizes of, of assets and deals. Okay, Peter. Well, yeah, thanks for that insight. And I, was, I wanted to ask you and have this conversation largely around Fsofitamod and, and sarcoidosis, but for those I'm not quite aware, can you define what those are real quick? Yeah, so Fsofitamod is an FC fusion protein uh, drug candidate that we're developing at ATIA. This is a, a protein that comes from our proprietary platform of tRNA synthetase biology. Mm -hmm. And it's really based on a naturally occurring fragment of a tRNA synthetase called histidyl tRNA synthetase that we discovered to have immunomodulatory properties. So we've fused that to an FC to give it better pharmacokinetic properties or help it stick around longer in the blood. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're developing that for the treatment of interstitial lung diseases, which were a group of uh, lung diseases which primarily affect the lung uh, parenchyma, which is, you know, the tissue in the lung. And what they what ends up happening is you get overactive inflammation in the lungs. You can develop scarring and, you know, which is called fibrosis. And you basically get this thickening of the lung tissue, which one restricts how the lungs can expand and contract, which you know you use for breathing, and two can block the, the flow of oxygen from the lung sacs into the bloodstream. So it's called a restrictive uh, lung disease. Mm -hmm. So we're developing efsafitamod for the treatment mm -hmm. of, of this group of diseases and really with the goal of reducing the chronic inflammation that can then lead to that fibrosis or scarring. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to that, that, that sarcoidosis, like how many people in the U S tend, tend to have this and, and what about that versus like worldwide? Yeah, there's about 200,000 patients in the U S with sarcoidosis. So it's what's considered an orphan disease here. So mm -hmm. the cutoff for orphan drugs, which is, you know, a group of diseases, which the FDA defines as, you know, having kind of uh, a limited population in you have developed this orphan drug program to incentivize development of new therapies for these diseases. The cutoff is about 200,000 patients. So we have uh, received that de designation from the FDA. Mm -hmm. um, about 90% of those will have lung involvement. So what we call mm -hmm. pulmonary sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis can affect any organ in the body, but by far predominantly affects the lungs. As I said, over 90% of patients about 30% may have a secondary organ uh, involved, which can be the skin, the eyes, you know, most commonly. Um, and globally, we we estimate about, you know, north of a million patients with sarcoidosis. Oh, okay. All right. And so with this being like, I guess not, it's a decently rare thing. How many of these people who develop it get it like diagnosed and treated? And like, um, what, what's the real importance of getting things out there to treat these right now? Yeah, I mean, super, super important to get new new treatments for sarcoidosis. So everything that's used currently, uh, older drugs that haven't received FDA approval for the disease. So the only FDA approved products were approved in the 1950s, and, and there's only two of those. 
if you know anything about the FDA, uh, the drug approval standards in the 1950s were very different than they are today. So mm -hmm. sometimes older drugs will have these uh, diseases listed on their prescribing information with really limited evidence to support that. It's more, you know, more uh, uh, theoretical. And so typically the first line treatment for sarcoidosis are corticosteroids about 50 to 75 percent of patients will get put on steroids mm -hmm. um, during you know the course of their disease and some of those having to to stay on those steroids for for many years often you know the disease is diagnosed um, relatively early in life so between the ages of 30 and 50 and so if you you know develop sarcoidosis when you're in your 30s and you have to start taking steroids for the rest of your life that can have really really uh, negative long-term yeah. effects um and some of those effects you know can take hold and be with you for the rest of your life things like yeah. hypertension and exacerbation of diabetes or you know osteoporosis so you know with these old drugs and you know not well proven uh, uh, demonstrated efficacy as alongside these you know significant toxic side effects you know, there's a really high high unmet need for getting new therapies to these patients gotcha and so then how would epsilphenamod be kind of positioned to help people with sarcoidosis like compared to those other treatments how would they be taking it and so on assuming everything gets approved and everything goes goes the way it should yeah so basically epsilphenamod you know we see it as one you know, will have demonstrated efficacy in the disease. So we're running, you know, a, a, a well thought out development program, um, uh, you know, with well controlled clinical trials to really establish, uh, you know, clinically proven efficacy of ifsafitamod in the disease, looking at, at you know, the ability of the drug to, to allow people to come off steroids. We're looking at, you know, the effect on people's lung function, uh, through uh, a, a primary measure called force vital capacity, and we're also looking at you know the effect that the the drug will have on patients' symptoms, so how they're feeling um, and how they're functioning. And so you know we'll you know if all goes to plan, we'll have established that efficacy through those three parameters. And then we also you know we also see this as being a much safer drug than what's currently out there. So. Steroids in particular, as I mentioned, have some of these long-term side effects that can develop and really be debilitating for patients. Um, but also the other available treatments that are sometimes used as second and third line treatment, things like methotrexate and azathioprine, those are also you know, older immunomodulatory therapies that were approved in the 1980s. And are basically chemotherapies. They're just used in, in uh, as immune suppressants when you have yeah. uh, you know, severe inflammation. But they are, you know have a ton of side effects as well. Things like you know, severe infections because they're knocking out all your immune cells, yeah. or uh, even can cause you know certain types of cancers if if not monitored carefully. And then third line, you know, sometimes off label biologics are used like. Uh, Humira, which you know, as you may know, is the biggest selling drug in the world, um, or you know, uh, Remicade, which is another uh, anti TNF inhibitor. These you know have shown some benefits clinically, but also are used. You know, they're not approved for use by the FDA, and they're typically you know you know, carry higher price tags. And you know, when you are using them off label, there can be issues with getting those treatments reimbursed by insurance. Yeah, fair enough. And I guess, so out of these people affected by it, who would be your, your your core population of patients, so to speak? Right. So I think the core population would be, you know, avoiding the use of second and third line, the currently available second and third line therapies. So we could take patients off, you know, avoid the need to put them on things like methotrexate or, you know, infliximab and just replace that with with uh, with efsafetamod. And that's about 30% of all patients are mm -hmm. gonna be put on those second and third line therapies. Mm -hmm. As an upside population, we see patients who are on steroids currently and you know, either at risk of progression despite being on, on corticosteroids um, or on steroids and you know, they've been on chronic steroids and they've developed 
some of these, you know, or, or dealing with some of these long-term side effects. And, you know, we see if sulfitamide could be used as a steroid sparing agent in those patients. Gotcha. And I guess, um, so what, what's it expected to cost of sulfitamide and like, how is that compared to other products? And like, is, are there other competitors at play here? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a little early to get into a pricing discussion uh, right now on, on Fsofitamide. I think we think in terms of looking at comparable types of products, you can look at the uh, biologic immunomodulators that are used for autoimmune diseases, things like Humira and, and Remicade, as I mentioned, other TNF inhibitors. You could also look at the drugs that are used for you know another form of interstitial lung disease called IPF, mm -hmm. which are uh, marketed by Roche and Beringer Engelheim. This is uh, uh, Isbriet and Ofev. Uh, and what those drugs cost is kind of comparable um, benchmarks. So we think there's, there's, you know, it's going to be a premium price product, but without getting into specifics on, uh, on the details on that, which obviously depend on a number of different factors, largely, you know, the data that you can generate and benefit mm -hmm. of current therapies fair enough and um so talk to me about this this orphan drug designation and like like what that does for you guys in terms of for for ip or for patent exclusivity mm -hmm. yeah so the orphan drug designation is a scheme put in place by the fda to help incentivize development of drugs for rare diseases that uh had been typically overlooked by uh, pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. and what it allows you to do is one have a little bit more interaction with the FDA um, during the development process it allows you to um, you know avoid some of the fees of of filing your drug for approval so there's something called the PDUFA fee which is pre pre prescription drug user fee act so when you file a drug with the FDA for approval uh, you have to pay a, a pretty hefty um, filing fee, you know, to cover <laughs> cover the cost of their work. You avoid that with with orphan designation, and then it also grants you seven years of market exclusivity in that disease from the time of approval. And this is something that you know you can see. This applies from the time of approval in a specific in indication. So if you have your first approval with an orphan disease, it'll be from, you know, seven years from that date. But if you get another indication approved a few years later, you know, that's also an orphan disease. You could have, you know, seven years from that date of exclusivity in that indication. Okay. And anyway, when you, you talk about other potential diseases here, there, there's, there's a lot more than just one type of interstitial lung disease. So what other ones, what other types of ILD diseases do you think could be a market opportunity for it? And uh, what do you think the size potential is there? Yeah, so there's about 200 different types of interstitial lung disease, you know, all sort of bucketed these, these different diseases that, like I mentioned, all end up uh, end up affecting the lung interstitium, defining them as interstitial. I think when the way we look at it, there's about 80% of the patients that are covered by the four main types out of those 200. So the four main types of, of uh, ILD, or interstitial lung disease, uh, sarcoidosis, IPF, uh, connective tissue disease related to ILD, and then another group called chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Okay. We look at it as, you know, given the mechanism of action of our drug is targeting the immune response and trying to prevent fibrosis or trying to stop the, the progression of fibrosis, um, we look at the, the types of interstitial lung disease that are more defined as immune driven as the really the target market for Fsofitamon. So this is, you know, really the connective tissue disease related ILDs, things like rheumatoid arthritis ILD or systemic sclerosis related ILD uh, could be potential uh, market opportunities for us. And then also chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is, a you know, again, a, a group of diseases that are caused by inhalation of chronic autoantigens. So these can be caused by things like, you know, people that own, uh, have pet birds, for example, and are chronically exposed to, uh, to feather particles can develop this oh. disease or people that, you know, have a lot of mold in their house and are chronically exposed to that sometimes are predisposed. So that's another, you know, really 
immune driven form of interstitial lung disease that can have severe consequences. IPF is a disease where, you know, has obviously gotten a lot of attention from industry. There's two approved products. They're selling very well. There's a lot of development focus in that area. But, you know, the immune component of IPF is a little bit less well-defined. There's definitely, um, you know, active research going on in that area. But as a, as a kind of drug target, it's been less well-explored. Mm-hmm. And why, why do you think sarcoidosis is like not anywhere near on people's radars versus the other ones? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the way that what you often see in drug development and in, um, you know, in uh, commercialization of drugs is that once a drug gets approved and once a, a pharmaceutical company starts marketing that drug, they really build the awareness around that indication. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, with interstitial lung disease, you saw a little bit of development activity, including in sarcoidosis in the early 2000s. Um, There were some trials run with infliximab and and a couple of other TNF inhibitors back then, but nothing was approved at the time. And so I think you saw some of that activity dry up. In IPF, you had two drugs approved in 2014, uh, the drugs from Roche and and BI. And that really, you know, helped raise awareness for that indication. It also set, you know, it set a regulatory precedent for how to get a drug approved in that indication. And it also showed people that, you know, you could establish a good price and, you know, generate good revenue with a drug in that indication. Now, the way we think about it is you now also have two drugs serving that market and your burden for proof is also going to get harder as you try and bring new drugs in because when you have established products, you're going to have to show that you're either you know, better or safer than those products to, to gain utilization, yeah. right? So yeah. our view is a little bit that, look, you know, even though the road's a little bit less well paved in sarcoidosis, there's also, you know, more opportunity once we get to the, get to the finish line because there's nothing out there for these patients. Yeah, yeah, well said, Peter. Well, listen, thank you for coming on and introducing yourself and sharing your insight today. Um, if anyone else has any questions for Peter or anyone else on the team, don't be afraid to reach out. We'll happily answer them. But for now, Peter, again, thank you for your time. Any closing words from you before we go? No, thanks for the opportunity. And yeah, we think this is a you know this is a really um, important unmet need to treat you know for these patients with sarcoidosis that currently have no good options. And you know, we're hoping that if cefetimod can be uh, you know, really meaningful, meaningful drug for these patients in the future. Perfect. Well, Peter, thank you again for your time today. Thank you everybody for watching and Peter, please have a wonderful day. Great. Thanks, Michael.